In part one of optimizing the oral microbiome, we saw that I was using a homemade mouthwash as a prebiotic for the oral microbiome. So what does that mouthwash include? Well, it includes 11 grams each of xylitol and sodium bicarbonate, three drops of peppermint oil, four grams of potassium nitrate, and all of that together as a prebiotic mixture in one liter of water. So why are each of these components there? Well, xylitol has been shown to inhibit the growth of a uh, bacterium that's related to cavity formation, Streptococcus mutans or S mutans. Uh, sodium bicarbonate is there because it alkalinizes the mouth and note that cavities form at an acidic pH. So having bicarbonate there would be, be expected to remove acid uh, from the mouth. Peppermint oil has been shown to limit growth of P. gingivalis. And then potassium nitrate, which was the newest addition. I've used this mouthwash for a while, but prior to this test, I included potassium nitrate. This was a new addition. I expected that it would increase nitrate-reducing bacteria in the mouth, which may also limit growth of bacteria that have been linked with poor oral and systemic health. So we can see that visually here. So an increase in oral nitrate has been shown to increase health-associated oral bacteria, including Neisseria and Rothia, while decreasing levels of bacteria in the mouth that are related to bad breath or halitosis, period, periodontal disease, and caries or cavity formation. So that's what I expected to see. Now, in part two, in today's video, we'll see, was my salivary microbiome composition improved relative to test number one? And there are three questions involved in that question. First, were levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria increased? Second, beyond uh, levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria, were levels of other oral health-related bacteria improved? And third, beyond the mouth, were levels of oral bacteria that have been linked with adverse systemic health reduced? And to answer these questions, I sent another saliva sample to Bristol. And if you're interested in quantifying your own oral microbiome or uh, salivary microbiome, uh, you can use my discount link, Conquer, Age of, Conquer Aging 15, and that link will be in the video's description. All right, so for test number two, the first question up is, were levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria increased? And that's what we can see here. We've got seven bacterial species that have been shown to have nitrate-reducing ability. So for the first test, we can see that the relative abundance, the sum of all of these bacteria in my saliva sample was 53%. So in other words, 53.1%. So in other words, of all of my bacteria, just these seven species were 53%. So based on having nitrate in the mouthwash, I, I expected to see an increase in these nitrate-reducing bacteria. But that's not the case. In fact, it looks like, well, not it looks like, it went down to 46%. So... Uh, now, these aren't the only species that are related to nitrate reduction. And in fact, there are up to 30 or more bacteria. And you can see the paper link that I've got there, Rossier uh, 2020. And that link is in the video's description too, if you're interested in checking out which bacteria besides the one on this short list. So when I sum all of the 30 bacteria that have been shown to have nitrate reducing ability, that comes to 78% for test number one, and then about 69% for test number two. So in other words, no matter how you cut it, nitrate levels, uh, nitrate reducing bacteria were not increased despite having four grams per liter of potassium nitrate in the mouthwash. So then the question is why? So I'm already on a high nitrate diet, which may have saturated oral nitrate levels, which would be then expected to limit any further growth of nitrate-reducing bacteria in my saliva. So, that's, uh, so we can see that here by looking at the foods that I commonly consume that have nitrate, and you can see the nitrate con uh, content there is milligrams of nitrate per 100 grams of each of these foods. And because I track my diet every day, I know my average intake for at least the one week period before test number two. So we can see my average daily intake for each of those foods there. And then we can calculate my average daily nitrate from each of these foods by multiplying the nitrate content by my average intake for each of these foods as shown in the right column. So then when taking the sum of nitrate for all of these foods, that comes out to um, about 1,700 milligrams of nitrate, dietary nitrate, per day. So is, how do I know that's high or low or, or its status? Well, an acceptable daily intake for nitrate has been reported as 3.7 milligrams of nitrate per kilograms of body weight per day. So my current body weight is 69.1 kilograms or 152 pounds. And when multiplying 69.1 kilograms by 3.7 milligrams of nitrate per kilogram body weight, we get an acceptable daily intake for nitrate of 256 milligrams per day. So my current intake of 1,700 milligrams per day is six to seven times higher. So that's why we can see I'm already on a high nitrate diet, which may have saturated oral nitrate levels. 
So should I remove KNO3 or potassium nitrate from the mouthwash? So before making that uh, decision, let's take a look at the rest of my oral, uh, oral microbiome composition. So outside of nitrate reducing bacteria, uh, were levels of other salivary bacteria affected? And for that, we're going to take a look at Bristol's definition of beneficial bacteria. We can see that one of them does include Neisseria, Neisseria mucosa, the second bacterium on the list, but the rest are not related to Neisseria or Rothia. So for the first test, I had 21.4% of quote-unquote beneficial bacteria, bacteria that have been linked with oral health. But for the second test, I had a similar amount, 21.1%. So to answer the question, were levels of oral health bacteria related, oral health related bacteria increased? The answer is no. So from this, we can see that having potassium nitrate in this prebiotic mouthwash didn't only, uh, it didn't increase nitrate reducing bacteria, but it also didn't in increase levels of other oral health related bacteria. So what about uh, levels of uh, bacteria that have been shown to be associated with poor oral health, where they reduced as a result of having nitrate in the mouthwash. So here we're gonna start off with bacteria that have been linked with gum inflammation. So for test number one, uh, I had 3.8% of all of my bacteria were related to gum, in gum inflammation. And for test number two, there was some improvement. So reduction to 1.8%. Now, if I'm gonna make further improvements, where would that be? So we can see that the majority of that 1.8% comes from two bacterium. So Fusobacterium nucleatum is shown with the red arrow, and then also another red arrow with Tanarella forsythia. So when you sum those two, that's 1.5%. So if I can reduce those, I, I should be able to reduce that 1.8% of, of bacteria that are related to gum inflammation to maybe even lower, somewhere around 0.3%. All right, so what about levels of bad breath-related bacteria? Were they reduced as a result of, of the prebiotic mouthwash? So we can see here bacteria related to halitosis. So for the first test, I had 5.5% of all bacteria that were related to, uh, or that have been shown to be related to halitosis. And for test number two, essentially the same, or at best a minor reduction, 5.2%. So once again, if I'm gonna make improvements, we can see those two bacteria pop up again, Fusobacterium nucleatum and Tanarella forsythia. So 1.5% of that 5.2, if I can somehow reduce those bacteria, would make a bigger dent in bad breath, bad breath related bacteria. All right, what about levels of tooth decay related bacteria? Were they reduced? So for that, we go to a different picture and we can see uh, uh, we're looking at dental caries or cavities and bacteria that have been uh, shown to be related to uh, cavity formation. And for both tests, for the first test, I had 0%, which is good news. For the second test, I had a small, but still uh, approximately zero uh, increase for one of these bacteria. Nonetheless, we can see I have 0% uh, percent of all of my bacteria uh, related to cavity formation or caries. So what about levels of bacteria that have been linked with other poor oral health related conditions? Were they reduced? One of those conditions is primary endodontic infection, which is infection of the dental root inside the tooth. And we can see that for both tests, I had a lot of those bacteria. So without going through each one, by taking the sum for the first test, 2.9%. For the second test, there was some improvement, 1.7%. Now, if I'm going to make further improvements, just like the, for, the, for some of the other conditions, we saw those two bacteria. And once again, we can see those two bacteria again, Fusobacteria uh, nucleatum and Tanarella forsythia. 1.5% of the 1.7%. So if I can reduce those two levels of those two bacterium, it would make a big dent, or it should make a big dent for overall reducing that 1.7 to 1.5. All right, also periodontal disease. For test number one, I had 0.7%. Test number two, it actually went in the wrong direction, 1.2%. And But once again, we can see that Tanarella forsythia popping up, 0.8% of the 1.2% comes from that bacterium alone. So for a summary for the uh, bacteria that have been linked with conditions in the mouth, we can see I had decreased levels of nitrate reducing bacteria. So I put that in red going in the wrong direction. And then for green going in the right direction, levels of bacteria related to gum inflammation, so decreased, and levels of bacteria related to primary endodontic infection. Unchanged were levels of beneficial bacteria. And I put that in black because it's, uh, it's really not known what the optimal percentage should be. Is it 21%, should it be 24% or higher? Who knows? Nonetheless, I put halitosis in red because who wants to have relatively high levels of bad breath related bacteria in their mouth? I don't. And unchanged were dental caries. I had zero before and a zero again, which is good news. And then increased in red going in the wrong direction are bacteria related to periodontal disease. So if we, if we take the net picture, we can see I've got three green, three red, and one that didn't change. Essentially a neutral effect of my uh, pro, uh, 
prebiotic mouthwash on uh, conditions related to inside the mouth. So what about levels of salivary bacteria that have been linked with adverse health conditions outside the mouth? Were they reduced as a result of having nitrate in the mouthwash? So first, let's take a look at bacteria related to atherosclerotic plaque, oral salivary bacteria. For the first test, I had 2.3%, and then there was a reduction, 2.9%. So once again, though, if I'm going to further reduce that 0.9%, uh, we can see that Tanarella forsythia again pops up. 0.8 of the 0.9% just comes from that one bacterium. Bacteria, oral bacteria that have been linked with pneumonia, I had 0.3% for the first test, 0.8% uh, for the second, so that's going in the wrong direction, uh, so I've got to keep an eye on that. Oral bacteria, salivary bacteria that have been linked with rheumatoid arthritis, so I had 0.8 for the first test, 0.8 for the second test, so no, no change there. But again, note that if I'm going to make improvements to reduce that 0.8, Tanarella forsythia, once again, all of that 0.8% for the second test comes exclusively from that one bacterium. And then Sjogren's syndrome, I've got a bunch of bacteria related to that, but still relatively low levels, 0.2% test number one to 0.2 on test number two. And then uh, lupus, so that's an autoimmune disease. I've got a bunch of bacteria that are related to that, unfortunately, and it actually went up from 0.7% on the first test to 2.3% on the second test. And I don't have a strategy to go after that yet. Uh, I think the better strategy is to go after those two bacterium that have been popping up in all these adverse health, both inside the mouth and outside the mouth uh, related conditions. So in taking the sum from each of these bacteria that have been linked with adverse health related conditions outside the mouth, that sum is 4.3% for test number one, and there was some improvement at 3.4% uh, for test number two. So, uh, but note that these, these aren't a major changes. These are very small changes for each respective condition. So I think it's fair to say that it looks like having four grams of nitrate, four grams per liter of nitrate uh, in my prebiotic mouthwash didn't have a major impact on salivary bacterial composition. So to answer that question, should I remove it from the mouthwash, I'm going to cut it in half. And that would be the first step before actually removing it. Uh, cut it in half, see how the, how the overall microbiome composition looks for my saliva for the next test. So then the big question uh, becomes, how, can, how else can I improve my salivary microbiome? And as, as noted, you know, I've been indicating these two bacterium that have been popping up everywhere. So what reduces levels of these two bacterium? So first, uh, beta-caryophyllene, which is found in clove oil, has been shown to reduce Tanarella forsythia growth. So on the y-axis, we're looking at growth of Tanarella forsythia against the concentration of beta-caryophyllene, which again is found in clove oil. So when compared with the uh, controls, we can see that a relatively low amount of beta-caryophyllene leads to an 80% reduction in Tanarella forsythia growth. So that's good news. Now, beta-caryophyllene and clove oil each have been shown to also reduce levels of that other bacterium that popped up in a whole bunch of different places, Fusobacterium nucleatum's growth. And we can see that here. So first, we're looking at the MIC uh, and the MBC. So what is that? So first, the MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration. That's the minimum amount of either beta caryophyllene or clove oil that inhibits growth of this bacterium. And the MBC is the minimum bactericidal concentration. So how little of each of these two components, beta caryophyllene and clove oil, do you need to completely kill off this bacterium? So we can see that beta caryophyllene first has some ability to both inhibit growth and to kill levels of Fusobacterium nucleatum. But note that when you look at the data for clove oil, 0.1 and 0.2, far lower amounts of clove oil can both inhibit and kill off Fusobacterium nucleatum. So from con when considering both of these data for these two different bacteria and components of clove oil or clove oil itself uh, may impact that, for the next test, I'm going to include that in my prebiotic mixture. But note that these are in vitro studies. There's no data uh, or RCTs looking at this in vivo. So whether it will work or not, that's unknown. But I can do that experiment by, again, uh, testing my salivary microbiome with bristle. So for the next test, besides reducing my potassium nitrate levels in the prebiotic mixture to 2 grams per liter, uh, so cutting it in half, I'm going to add 3 drops of clove oil, an equivalent amount, the, the same amount that I've got for peppermint oil. And again, even how much of an amount, very debatable. Uh, but all I can do is test and evaluate the data for my salivary microbiome once I get it to see if it made an effect or not. So stay tuned for test number three to see how the story goes. All right, uh, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. 
Now, before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links. Uh, the first being oral microbiome composition. If you're interested in that, I've got a discount link, Conquer Aging, Conquer Aging 15 uh, through Bristle. If you want to test your epigenetic age, discount link for that. Uh, At-home blood testing using Quantify, diet tracking with Chronometer, or if you would just like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. All of these links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.